going. And so the goal of this panel is to highlight some of the priorities identified in the interagency biosecurity plan, hoping to foster a conversation on the importance and effectiveness of prevention strategies to have a policy-focused conversation that will help inform the final initiative report. And we have uh, two returning panelists, and so I'm going to be very brief by just saying that we're going to go in order, and Jules Quo is the Ballast, Water, and Biofouling Coordinator for the Hawaii Department of Land and Resor Natural Resources Division of Aquatic Resources. Vernon Harrington, who's returning, is the State Plant Health Director for USDA APHIS. Jonathan Ho is the Plant Quarantine Branch Manager for the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. And Christy Martin is the Program Manager and Public Information Officer at the University of Hawaii. Doesn't spell it out, but it's the PCSU Coordinating Group on Alien Pest Species. So we'll just begin with Jules. Thanks you all for thank to you all for being here. Hi everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> I just want to first start off by saying thank you to the coordinators for um, coordinating this workshop. I think it's been such a fantastic discussion among um, all the scientists and representatives and regulators here. And also, thank you very much for allowing me to invade the terrestrial discussion with some marine <laughs> discussion today, um, as well as the attendees uh, here and um, accessing the webinar. Thank you, folks, for being here to um, be a part of the solution on the biosecurity issues that we have. And from there, I will begin. So my name is Jules Quo. I'm with DLNR, uh, Division of Aquatic Resources. and. I'm here to talk a little bit about the Hawaii Ballast Water and Biofouling Program, which is uh, the program that I manage in the state. And so just to preface our challenges, um, currently we have about 350-ish aquatic non-indigenous species established within our state waters. Just to give you a comparison, continental U.S. states, the coastal states, combine all of their non-indigenous species aquatics. Um, they got 450, so unfortunately we're not doing so well, but there's a silver lining, I'll get to it eventually. And Australia's got 160. So just uh, take a look at the picture on the right. Our little couple islands is on the far left, and then we got continental US, and then Australia on the right side. So there's some comparisons. The top two vectors of aquatic non-indigenous non species transfer into the state are um, vessel biofouling and ballast water discharge. And I'll get into more detail as to what those are. Currently, we are sitting in one of the islands in that circled area called Hawaii. And we rely very heavily on the shipping industry to bring our goods. And obviously, we're very grateful as well because without them, we wouldn't be able to sleep in these beds and have our office supplies, uh, groceries, toilet paper, and all the amazing ingredients that make this amazing gourmet food that we eat here quite frequently. So um, currently, uh, from data in 2017, we receive about 1,000 vessels, and this has been consistent over time, over the decade. Um, and that's not to say that there's um, less stuff coming here. In fact, there's probably more, but the ships are just much larger, so they carry more ballast water and et cetera. Most of the vessels are arriving into Oahu, therefore it makes it a hub for non-indigenous species. The next most visited um, island is Big Island, and then we, ooh, backward? I oh, have no idea, there Magic. we go. And then we have the other uh, neighboring islands that receive also um, some level of uh, vessel coming. But this isn't the, the whole picture, right? This is just the commercial vessels that report to us coming from outside. And it's actually voluntary for inter-island vessels um, to report to us. So big thanks to them, um, but it's not the whole picture that we see here. Most of the vessels that are coming here are mostly container vessels, uh, passenger vessels, cruise lines, and tankers bring our oils, uh, fuels to fuel our cars. And then we also have the other breakdown of the other types of vessels. Vessel biofouling is the attachment of organisms to the submerged areas of the ship. So here's a picture of biofouling, and here's another one of <laughs> biofouling that has not been managed probably for years and decades or so, and it's pretty scary. They contain ecosystems, um, so you can see the issue of it 
transiting, let's say, from Oahu to you know, Kauai, somewhere more pristine. Ballast water is the water that's picked up in a location, in a harbor, most likely, um, to stabilize a vessel's transit, uh, especially if it's carrying cargo, um, over to another location. For example, if a vessel is coming from China and it's got um, not that much cargo on it, it's going to pick up ballast water, center its, uh, stabilize its center of gravity, and then if they don't manage the ballast water with some kind of treatment system like chlorine or UV, and they discharge the ballast water in our state, then we have the potential of receiving these propagules, these babies of um, invasive species. So here are a couple examples. There's a barnacle, Anoplii, which is also known as a baby. Marine worm baby, on the right side, we've got clam oysters and mussel potential uh, babies, and then marine snail at the bottom. And what they do is they basically establish, as a st uh, they look around for a nice home to sit in, stay there forever, and they turn into these adults that you see uh, in this picture. And while the ecosystem is impacted by these organisms, um, there's a lot of chain effects that occur afterwards. So why do we care about these invasive species? Because they impact our recreational uh, fishing folks, including spearfisher women and men. Um, and by the way, the coral reef ecosystem, our natural um, aquatic and cultural uh, resources bring in about 800 million dollars in revenue, gross revenue, to the state. And this is a statistic from about 2000, so it's probably increased since then. Uh, invasive species have the ability to affect our aquaculture industry, fishing industry, and they also have been shown to affect humans. Um, unfortunately, in this example, there was Vibrio cholera that was discharged into a South America area, and there was a high mortality rate of humans. So. Besides you know, socioeconomic impact, there's human health impacts as well. So the silver lining is that we do have a program to prevent further introduction. Um, and it's specialized in pre-border and border protection. And for today, I'm just going to focus on pre-border and specifically the first data point, the, um, excuse me, the first point vector risk assessments while there's some outreach component as well. We right now have ballast water regulations, um, which requires vessels to report their uh, ballast water information. They have to tell us where they've picked up their ballast water, what, what they treated it with, if they manage their ballast water, how much they're discharging to basically allow us to assess the risk of that vessel coming in. And so if we're concerned, then we can go and address it because we can't, we don't have enough capacity to assess all 1,000 vessels coming in. So right now we board with the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, we work very well as a team. Um, they're mostly our muscle, and we are the scientists, the kind of lighter colored folks is me and um, a technician. And what we do is we verify the reporting forms, and we also take samples um, and then enumerate the viability or the concentration of organisms that are in that ballast water. For biofouling rules, we hope to do the same thing. We don't have rules yet, but we're uh, developing them and hoping to implement them very soon because that's our top vector of introduction. They, it will in include a reporting form, as you see on the left side, and then also um, eventually inspections, and that's a picture of my uh, boss who used to also fill gaps since I'm kind of a one-person show sometimes uh, before he became the DAR administrator. <laughs> but we basically would do the inspections um, by scuba diving or using a robot called a remotely operated vehicle, which is what Dan is holding on the right picture. And then we'll also ideally like to sample the, the uh, organisms attached to these ships. So also part of the implementation will require us to roll out some best management practices and get folks educated and, and um, understanding what the issue is with microfouling and macrofouling and biofouling in general. So there's just wanted to give you a summary of what microfouling is. It's kind of the slime layer that's on the vessel side. And if you just like wipe it off, it's just this algae uh, bacterial layer, really easy to take off. So you don't really need too abrasive or aggressive tools to get that off. Um, in fact, this cloth or this little brush will kind of do the trick. And it's best to clean early and often because this microfouling layer is low biosecurity in comparison to the right picture, which is macrofouling. In that case, um, you do need aggressive tools because some of the like mussels and oysters are caked on there, so you gotta like really use a like a drill or something to get it off. But when you're pulling it off, there's also another constituent that comes off, which is the anti-fouling paint, which has 
chemicals and toxins potentially that are harmful to the environment. So the best case scenario here is to either dry dock, so haul your vessel out, or to use what's, in, what's called an underwater vacuum or in water cleaning capture system to capture that debris. So uh, kind of closing up here, um, <laughs> basically we are uh, follow these three strategic plans, including the Hawaii Interagency Biosecurity Plan, and this allows us to apply for grants. So we're soft funded right now. Um, we really do stretch every dollar, and like I said, I'm kind of a one-person show at times, but the positives is that we have a lot of collaborators that um, really do uh, make up for the capacity challenges. So. Last thing is, uh, while I kind of give you a grim view of the situation that is in Hawaii of a aquatic invasive species challenge, there are still so many, um, so many reefs right now that need saving and still have the, uh, the quality that we call you know, our aquatic natural resources. But through collaboration is, is what we we would be able to, um, excuse me, through collaboration is how we become successful. So that's it. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Berna? Okay. Um, let's see. I, I um, briefly went over our programs on, at a national level. I'll just go over some of the programs that we have, our regulatory activities and the programs that we have in Hawaii to assist with uh, prevention and early detection. This is our overall structure of, of Hawaii. Um, we have a work unit on every island, two on the big island, you know, one in a uh, port in Hilo and Kona. And um, let's see what else. We have pest detection, survey, Hawaii fruit fly facility. Um, we irradiate the fruit, we irradiate fruit flies from CDFA, send it over, and that's part of the flies that they utilize for the sterile insect release in, in uh, California. Uh, smuggling interdiction and Basic, excuse me. And then this here's a list is I think this is what makes us so successful um, is all the partnerships that we work with to get our job done. Hey, how did this thing go? I, here is just the operational partnerships. Like I say, anytime there's any risks or pests um, of concern, first thing we do is we get together. We get the affected industries, the regulatory agencies. Uh, we meet and we set up a plan of action. So that's one thing that is, is immediate. Whenever there is a known pest or threat, um, we get together immediately uh, for an immediate and appropriate response. And well, I'll let you know, I mean, the congressional staffers here in Hawaii, especially working in the federal building, I can never run away from them because when I go to lunch, I see them. So, <laughs> so, so we always include them and deal with that. And uh, Mark helped me with that a lot. Uh, let's see. We have a cooperative agriculture pest survey of uh, quarantine concern. Right now it's 546 million that we work with the Hawaii, Hawaii Department of Agriculture, Department of Land and Natural Resources, University of Hawaii, Guam. We also work with the American Samoa and the CNMIs. Basically what it is to look at pests or pests of concern that they're concerned of and it protects our pathway. So we try and put as much money as we can into these different programs for early detection. If we find something early enough, then we can work together to uh, work to eradicate or suppress it. That's just more of that. Farm bill, uh, right now the farm bill is about 2.5 million. And that goes to things like the coconut um, rhinoceros, rhinoceros beetle here in Hawaii and also supporting the program in Guam. And recently there was an outbreak in, in Rhoda, I always say Roland, in, in Rhoda that um, has been, we were fortunate there because I guess they found it really early and it was someone, the person who found it was actually a collaborator with Customs, with, I mean, with Customs out of Guam. And um, so they went to the training and when they were there, they actually um, recognized the damage and they found it early. And there's a buffer of the water, you know, water in a narrow, narrow way. So it actually, they actually went in there, sanitized the area and pushed it all back. And I think if anywhere that there would be a possibility of eradication would be that area in Rhoda, which was very impressive how they, you know, had an immediate response and, and took care of that. So looking forward to actually going there and seeing it. 
Again, here is just like just a dollar amount, and I know, I believe these slides will be available. And each state, as a state plan health director, that's part of our job, is we work with the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. We partner with them and look at what's important and what's at risk for the state, what's at risk to the state. So as a state plan health director, that's my charge is to work with the Hawaii Department of Agriculture and then find these funding, you know, these funding from the from our farm bill and our on our um, CAPS program, Cooperative Pest Survey programs. We mentioned earlier, um, you know, because we have systems that are different, we deal with foreign arrivals, the state deals with domestic. So looking at the different pests and we have, C, you know, Customs and Border Protection. So basically what we do is we have these different agencies meeting on a regular basis um, and, and looking for these different threats or pathways and how we can re respond to them. Smuggling and trade, uh, smuggling interdiction and trade compliance. Basically, like I think it was mentioned about with the internet, with sales, um, e even with Costco's and Walmart. I think you know they were selling. Were they selling um, coffee plants? I mean, one of them brought in coffee. They didn't know, I mean, or is it Longs? Longs. Right? So a lot of these larger companies, they actually go ahead and sell things, not even know, you know, not even knowing that it, that's prohibited, or they bring in large volumes of, of things. So. What we've done is with our smuggling uh, interdiction, we actually try and meet on a regular basis with these large distributors and let them know what the regulations are, open up that communication so that we can, we can stop it. And, and if something, you know, there's a lot of things that come in, but if something does come to Hawaii, we have a system set up where we actually, as soon as we, we find something, we, with, uh, we work with border protection, and then we meet immediately with the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. So we look at, you know, what was the risk coming in? Is it an acceptable risk? Can it be mitigated here in Hawaii? Or does it have to be, have to be re-exported or destroyed? And so what we do is we actually evaluate that risk as a group so that when we make, when we answer, and, and a, lot of, a lot of these issues go up to the congressional representatives. So when we do answer those questions, we resolve it here in Hawaii as, as, a, as a team, as CBP, the Hawaii Department of Agriculture and PPQ. So it ends there instead of going back up to C DC and back down. So we can take immediate action and you know, we're pretty s secure and once we make the decision that, that it stays that way. And then here is the Guam Pacific collaboration and training. One of the things we're trying to do more is reach out to the Pacific and and assist with their programs, um, do training. Recently, we worked with American Samoa to get them an x-ray machine because they never had an x-ray machine. So and that, that's made a big impact in their airport operations and foreign arrivals. Um, we also train their inspectors. We've, tr we've had people from Guam or the different areas from the Pacific come and look at our program and mirror their program after hours. So we support them because the, the stronger the Pacific and those nations, I mean, those islands are out there, then the stronger the pathway is to protect Hawaii and then the Pacific, you know, and the continental U.S. Here, I just, uh, this is our plant inspection station. So Hawaii has a plant inspection station. Um, basically, when CBP, if Customs and Border Protection finds things in their imports, then we do the we do the ID and customs is really enforcing our regulations, but for live plants and plants for planting, it comes directly to our plant inspection station. So we issue permits, phytosanitary cer certificates. Uh, we deal with with CITES, uh, of course, working with the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. We um, monitor and regulate biotech uh, regulation. We work on permitting with containment facilities and post-entry. People are trying to uh, bring things in as far as what can be grown, so we have to work with a state through a compliance agreement and an MOU on meeting those requirements so it can come in. And sea uh, gaps, sea um, gaps and different invasive species groups. We're a partner of that, and Dorothy Alantago in my office, she's. Uh, very passionate about it. I, th I don't think there's a day goes by that I don't hear about what we need to do more for uh, for this program for Hawaii and the Pacific. So, <laughs> so 
So Dorothy, again, is, uh, is the representative, and she also is very familiar with our regulations and our requirements, so she's always working with our headquarters office. You're talking about that, you know, that gap or, or that, um, you know, not so the connection between DC, so that's the role that Dorothy is playing and, and looking at those regulations and what can be done. Fruit fly detection and program, again, we have, we have these, uh, the major fruit flies here. So we do have, um, we do actually do conduct fruit fly trapping because we have treatments, you know, we have, uh, we have irradiation, we have vapor heat treatment, we have different treatments so commodities can go out to either foreign or domestic, our trading partners. And if another uh, fruit fly, species of fruit fly got in, that could, you know, that could cause problems with our export or, so we actually do this monitoring and we work closely and looking at and working with the Hawaii Department of Agriculture because if we do find something new, then we can take immediate action and, and do additional trapping, delim <coughs> delimit and try and find out, you know, if that is a problem, if we can treat it. I think that's it. Okay, that's it, thanks. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> <coughs> Jonathan. No. Oh, okay, there we go. Thanks. Okay, so just like last time, this is the only picture you're going to get. <laughs> so yeah, Jonathan Ho, I'm the acting manager for the plant quarantine branch. Um, I'm going to talk um, real quickly about some um, pre-border pre prevention stuff that plant quarantine does. So um, I'll do a real quick overview of what plant quarantine does. Um, I'll talk uh, mostly about permitting um, our, our import permit process, and then um, what we do for Christmas trees for import since it's the Christmas season. And then a couple other strategies um, that we also do to maintain uh, pre-border compliance. Okay, so what we do, we inspect to protect. So, this is what we regulate. So we regulate live plants, non-propagative plant parts. So that's fruit, veg, um, hay, soil-free media. Uh, Non-domestic animals, so basically the things you don't see on a farm. So everything but dogs, cats, domestic goats and sheep, stuff like that. So cultures, known cultures of microorganisms and soil into the state. And um, you know, going back to the staffing, we have 85 guys to do this across the state. So we regulate pest. And you know, so I won't read it, but it's basically everything that can be bad for the environment or agriculture. So I'll go into permitting. So we regulate everything from an amoeba to a zebra. That's the easiest way to remember it. So everything that is alive, we regulate by permit. That's not a plant. So this is the prime mechanism for us for pre-entry compliance. So every animal, every non-domestic animal is on a list. Every list specifies the specific users and the type of use in which they can import these animals. Um, there are four lists. There is a conditionally approved, which is basically you can import for pretty much any use. You have restricted B, which is commercial use only. You have restricted A, which is essentially ex exhibition in a municipal zoo or aquarium or research in a university. And you have prohibited, so basically no importation at all. Any animal that is not on any of those lists is prohibited until it is placed on a list. And um, so what happens is uh, Hawaii is unique in that the way we issue permits for non-domestic animals is very specific to the use, to the user. So if person A wants to import animal B to do use C, there will be a very specific set of permit conditions based off of that use. Person B, who wants to do C, who wants to do F, will get a different set of conditions, even if it's for the same organism. So it creates a lot of specificity based off of the use, which can then reduce, reduce risk. Because again, you know, the specific use, the specific containment facility, all of those factors are taken into, into account before the permit conditions are issued. It's, that's like the whole thing in a nutshell. It's not that simple, but that's generally how it is. It's very specific for the use and for the person. Um, microorganism cultures, um, the use is very limited in that it's the, uh, the permit conditions are generated 
specifically for laboratory research, essentially, essentially for laboratory research. So all the conditions are set by rule, generally speaking. Um, if they're not for laboratory research, it goes through that same process that they would do for non-domestic animals. Um, we do permitting, uh, it's broken down by essentially by type. So we have land vertebrates, invertebrates, and aquatic biota, so stuff that's not an insect, plants, microorganisms, and insects. And then so there's basically a specific person that deals with the permits and the permit process for each of those sections. So yeah, so we'll do Christmas tree compliance, so it's that time of the year, so uh, partnership of success, because this compliance agreement is um, something that's uh, very uh, successful. It's between uh, Hawaii Department of Agriculture and uh, Washington State's Department of Agriculture and then Oregon's Department of Agriculture. So we get all of our Christmas trees from those two states. Basically, all the Western states get all their trees from these two states. Um, so we have a compliance agreement with these two um, other departments of ag who then implement it with their growers. There's very specific best management practices and phytosanitary requirements for each of the Christmas tree shipments that are imported into the state. Um, this is kind of a result of, in 2012, we had uh, 240 containers imported that year. Um, 93 of them were held for pests or um, paperwork problems. So about 61% of the trees pass on the first grow. The other, so 71 basically, we either sent them back or um, were treated in, in the state. Uh, this year, we had 185 containers imported. Two were held for treatment. Um, and. Um, with that being said, something, this compliance agreement is, um, Hawaii is set up very well for this agreement in that the trees are essentially brought in from, there's basically only four growers. And each of those growers supply each of the big box stores, Walmart, um, Lowe's, Home Depot, and I think somebody else does all the smaller guys. But essentially, they're contracted out. So what happens is, those growers basically have to do, if they want their Home Depot, they have to do the best management practices for Hawaii. But what's happened is all the best management practices, they've realized that doing it makes a better product for them. So like a lot of these guys, they do it for all their trees now. They don't do it just for Hawaii. They used to just do all, the Hawaii is you know, our small thing, we gotta do extra work for them. Now they just do it for all their trees. So now they're just, all their trees are real clean now. So that, that's something that's been uh, real effective. And then every year since 2012, there's been essentially like a half, uh, the percentage of rejections went down by half. 93, 63, 30, 12, well actually 12, and they went to like nine, and then it went to six, and then two or something like that. But yeah, so every year went down. And then so the other ones, I'm just going to really quickly talk about some other strategies that we, that we work with. And a lot of them are based off of um, our ability to um, have uh, working relationships with the people that we regulate. And, um, you know, so for example, like brown tree snake is one of our targeted pests. Um, we work very heavily with uh, wildlife services in Guam and the military um, to inspect um, all the planes and all the cargo and... Um, all the boats that come from Guam. I think we, last year, I think we, 98.6% 98 of all the, all the planes and stuff were inspected by us. Um, the ag forms has been um, talked about before. Um, educating and outreach, and I think this is one of the big ones that we're really trying to push in that if people understand what the requirements are, people will comply. Generally speaking, people aren't out there to break the law, and if they understand the law, they will comply. Um, you know, people will smuggle, and you know, the guys that are going to smuggle are going to smuggle no matter what you tell them. But if you can, if you can get the low-hanging fruit, that will really uh, increase compliance for everyone. And then the last one is um, is real quickly e-manifest. So the department we have um, um, we've implemented a pilot program for e-manifesting. So. What's happening is we're having um, specific importers who import basically only fresh produce. They electronically provide us um, a manifest of all of their commodities prior to entering to the state. So they have a, a, there's a time frame. And then what we're doing is we're able to review all of the commodities prior to entry and then we're able to then 
kind of take a look. Like, for example, the guy's bringing a whole container of onions. Instead of sending somebody out there to wait for the container to unload it to make sure there's onions, we can then have that person go somewhere else to, to um, focus on commodities that are of higher risk. Um, right now, the system is um, a little hammer and chisel. There's a lot of work on our end in order to make it um, really a uh, to make it work. Um, so we have a, a, a contract and we're coming out with, um, we're working actually through the, through the system now to have something where it's very comprehensive, where the importers will be able to basically have like a tool, they put all their stuff in, it'll tell you if it's right and they just submit it to us. And um, it will basically turn from like, I think right now, a normal inspection, if we were to get the same granularity for data, it would take about an hour a container, it would take about like three minutes with this system. So I mean, it's gonna create a huge amount of information for us to be able to do better risk assessments for, for uh, prioritiz prioritization for in, uh, inspections. And that's it, thanks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Christy? All right, mahalo, everybody still with us. Um, so I work for the coordinating group on alien pest species. Uh, the acronym is CGAP, so I get to talk to you today about gaps and uh, therefore opportunities for invasive species prevention. Uh, I'm not a one-person shop anymore. Um, I have a planner, Chelsea Arnott's in the room. I also have a legal fellow, a maritime lawyer, Andrew Porter, who's holding down the fort back uh, in Honolulu. And we have an outreach specialist that works on rapid ohia death, Amber Mokiao Lee. So we, we work together on a number of fronts. So I'm gonna take a moment here. Oh, actually, I need to tell you about this photo. Um, <laughs> so this is a pillowcase uh, full of brown tree snakes that we collected on Guam. Don't worry, it's not in Hawaii. Um, we collected this within about two hours of um, cruising along the fence line in Anderson Air Force Base, just plucking off the brown tree snakes that had crawled up there to eat the geckos because there's very few of their natural prey there anymore and that is birds and rodents. Uh, so um, there you go, exhibit A, invasives. Um, and so now I get to tell you some things that you already know. However, I've also put citations here. These are things that we agree on. Um, Invasive species are really one of the, the most serious and rapidly growing threats. And it's not just to agriculture, it's not just to human health, um, but as we know, it's a um, impact on all of these things and synergistically it is uh, a threat to all of us and all of our families. We know that trade is the main pathway. Yes, there's lots of other path, there's, there's a lot of things we could be working on, but there's a very large um, thing that we should be focusing on, and that is trade. And we know that trade and import inspection-related policies and functions are usually done by agricultural agencies, whereas the mitigation, the on-the-ground work, is typically with the resource management agencies. And so sometimes there can be a disconnect between those two things. Now we know relatively little about the interaction of pests, of agriculture, and the abiotic factors that are related to climate change. Um, but you know, as we move forward with those assessments to better understand how invasive species are gonna impact agriculture, we also have to consider all of those other things that we need to be able to live. So we have to include assessments that look at the interaction of pests and again, abiotic factors that impact clean water air, all of these other um, vital needs we have as human beings. A 2018 um, study that was uh, amazing, I, I, it was, it's one of the few studies that, you know, when a scientific study comes out, I usually just set it on the side and I get to it maybe sometime when I have insomnia. But this was a fascinating study. Um, it showed that about 25%, one quarter of all non-native species that are recorded as uh, um, becoming established somewhere in the world were novel species. That is, they had not become established elsewhere outside of their native range yet. So that means one quarter of these new species that are coming in are going to be things that are traveling on pathways that we're not used to. And in fact, this uh, report went on to say that it's a consequence of expanding trade networks, trade areas, as well as the impacts from environmental change. 
And something we all know, we, we, um, we in the practice talk about the rule of tens. Well, actually, it's higher than that. About 10 to 20 percent of those species that are introduced outside their native range then become invasive. So we know a lot about what we know. We know a lot about pathways, but there's also this big component of things that we don't know. And this has been something that the international community has worked on for quite a while now. In fact, there's been some high-level targets that have been set. Uh, so t by 2020, the Aichi Biodiversity Target 9 said, we're going to have all of the pest pathways um, identified and prioritized. We're going to work to mitigate those. United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, Target 15.8 said, absolutely, same thing. We're going to do that. Uh, and I think we can all agree it's 2018, and we're not on target. And so, um, you know, I work really closely with our federal partners, and I don't want to poke, um, but we need to do some serious introspection. <laughs> and I don't think I'm the only one in the room who's said this so far today. Um, but, and it's not a surprise to you folks, navigating the federal rules and processes, and even some of the language that's used, uh, is really difficult for people outside federal agencies. So I don't know how many times I call Dorothy, mahalo Dorothy, and say, what does this mean? <laughs> um, what process should we use? And, and so even something as simple as understanding uh, the federal opportunities, um, we need to do uh, probably better on that. And we know that states, um, you know, the Western Governors Association has been fantastic at being able to highlight that state focuses are not always aligned with federal agency focuses. We're very regional. And I want to think that that is actually a benefit. Um, states are your allies uh, for protecting the United States. And we can be even better allies if we had uh, additional communication and collaboration opportunities. And I, I've modified the USGS motto, Mahalo, uh, we need to focus on science and policies for a changing world, and we need to do this together. So I've got three examples here, um, uh, looking at prevention gaps and opportunities, and I want to, you know, someone else mentioned earlier today about gap analyses, and I think we need to continue to look at some of these. So here's, um, here's a gap. So Customs and Border Protection inspects uh, cargo coming in and conveyances. And they inspect and enforce under other agencies' authority. So, for example, they're looking for things that may be of U.S. Fish and Wildlife concern. They're looking for CITES things. They're opening the box anyway. Well, the Customs and Border Protection does not actually have the authority to take action if a human health vector is found in that conveyance. They don't have an agreement, an MOA, with the CDC to be able to do that. So they cannot legally stop that shipment. They can't hold that cargo. And that's a very easy thing to fix. But little OC gaps, uh, talking from Hawaii, has had a hard time doing it, so maybe Western Governors uh, Association, Association can give us a hand with that. Um, gap number two and opportunity number two really is, uh, again, circling back around to that idea of vessel biofouling. And I've put up the 2017 data for vessel traffic around the world, and that's just one year's worth of data. So vessel biofouling, again, is the species that grow and are transported on hulls, and it is largely unregulated in the U.S., in fact, in a lot of places of the world. Uh, when vessels need to be able to clean underwater, um, that, those species can be released and can start growing. And so it's a high risk for some vessels, uh, if they're clean in our waters, to be able to just drop those species off and and they'll take off and start a new population. Uh, there's been a recent federal rule change uh, with the Coast Guard Authorization Act that means that the way federal agencies manage and regulate discharges from vessels, including that hull fouling cleaning, uh, is gonna change. And so we have a four-year window, critical window, for states, all of us, to work together to um, be able to work with EPA and USGS sorry, U.S. Um, Coast Guard to be able to develop new rules and regulations to manage vessel biofouling and in-water cleaning. It's an opportunity because cleaner vessels will have 
fewer emissions, they'll have greater fuel efficiency. So this is one of those things that's you know, more than a triple win if we can do it right. And example number three is science and technology. You know, reducing pest numbers in key areas, for example, USDA's uh, fruit, fruit fly suppression in Hawaii, fantastic. We need to keep doing those things. We need to make sure they're supported. All of the work going on in Guam for suppressing brown tree snake numbers is fantastic because when you reduce numbers in that source area, reduce, you reduce the chance that they'll spread. And so we need to figure out how we can do more of that. And one way has been talked about a lot, we're going to talk more about it today, and that's uh, considering uh, enhancing our ability to do regional biocontrol. Let's drop pest numbers so that they have less of a chance of impacting U.S. agriculture. And we need to consider these new technology ideas and be an adopter of some of these, because wouldn't it be great if we could render mos mosquitoes unable to spread disease? So, mahalo. Thank you very much. Uh, let's do a couple of questions here to the group, and I think there's a global one in two parts that hangs over all of this, and that is uh, really uh, to do pre-border uh, detection or prevention. It requires relationships or actions or cooperation with other countries. Similarly, it requires uh, those kind of efforts with private industry, and we saw the uh, clearly a, a ship that was a private industry releasing the water, uh, the ballast water. So let's start with other countries. Um, what are those collaborative relationships like? What needs to be done that's not being done? Who wants to start with that? Start. And so regarding our work with other countries, you know, we, we've already heard about some great examples. The regional biosecurity um, initiative is one of them. I think that's a perfect example of what we can do. You know, when the IUCN, uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, World Conservation Congress was here in 2016, uh, we worked with the IUCN to launch the Honolulu Challenge, and uh, it was upon, you know, Patty's slides about, you know, just one of these initiatives. And so when you look at what that is, it is a platform for different nations and even sub-nations to come up with a, um, a wild and crazy idea uh, and, and pledge, challenge yourself to do it on this international stage to be able to try to achieve it. And an example of that, of someone who's taken the Honolulu Challenge, is New Zealand. And we can learn a lot from what they're doing. You know, they've got this goal of predator-free by 2050 for their country. And they don't have all the tools they, they need to be able to accomplish that. They don't have all the money. They don't have it all planned out. But it is a wild and crazy idea. They're pledging to do it. And, you know, I plan on being around, and I'm, I'm just going to take bets. You know, I think they're going to make it. And if they don't make it, they're going to get darn close. And so it's ideas like that that we can really learn from um, with other countries. And so um, I invite all of us to sort of figure out, you know, who we can copy and adopt. Um, <coughs> Jules, you had something to say. Yeah, so kind of going off of um, what Christy said, uh, but in a different direction. Right now, we work very closely with um, our Australia and New Zealand partners um, because they do have biofouling regs in place. Uh, they're pretty robust, and um, California as well, they have regulations. So we're not reinventing the wheel um, because that would take a really long time. In fact, we're kind of just copying and pasting and stamping our, um, <laughs> our uh, logo on it. And, you know, tweaking it to, to mimic our um, appropriately address security issue, biosecurity issues in the state of Hawaii. Uh, so we actually chat regularly uh, every month um, via toll-free, because it's really expensive to call in, um, just, you know, in general. And then um, I think it's absolutely important, and maybe uh, some of you or most of you agree, that um, when you're collaborating with folks, it's important to get everyone actually in the room in person to have a chat. It's 
very much different when you're on the phone or through Skype. Um, actually having that interaction uh, really does make a difference because you know, a lot of communication is through body language. Um, and yeah, we, I think we're able to make a lot of headway um, by meeting in person. So just that was kind of a suggestion and that's also what we do uh, in the program. I'll just add for on PPQ side, I think, um, you know, we already have off, right now we have offshore initiatives where, you know, we, we look at, we go through other countries that are um, importing into the United States and then we, we have international service people, we work with them or, you know, we collaborate with them or we have staff from our policy and management who go. So they basically look at the potential threat, work with industry, work with the, with the other countries to have them treat and mitigate that pest before they come here. But I guess, you know, like this close collaboration as this group and the Western Governors Association identify things, and if you identify higher risk things that we, we may not be, you know, doing, I think we can expand upon that. So I think that's something to, to look at. Now let's move forward to sort of a private industry or companies. Uh, they're equally involved. Uh, what kind of prevention work and relationships do you establish other than just plain enforcement? Um, well, from, uh, at least from our standpoint, um, we deal, um, we spend the majority of our, uh, of our manpower uh, dealing with importation. And um, the people that are doing the importation are, you know, they live in Hawaii. And people that live in Hawaii recognize the impact that um, invasive species have. And um, for a lot of them, they just don't know. And once they understand, you know, like, why are you regulating my corn? Why do I need to have a certificate for corn coming into the state? I can get corn wherever I want. And then you explain to them, well, the reg is, is, is created specifically for a specific pest, European corn borer we don't have in Hawaii. And it's really bad for corn. So once they realize that, ah, the, the light turns on, that's why we got to do it, and they're they're on board. And I think it's a lot of that is just for, for those, like, for the companies, you know, they, they're they live here, um, they want to continue to do business here, and if they understand what needs to be, or why you're doing what you're doing, it's not, I have a stick and I'm gonna hit you with it. They are, are, are you know, more often than not are willing to work with you to make sure that um, we have a shared outcome, which is not having pests come in with their stuff. Great. And, and as far as for, for my experience, as far as working with private industry, I, you know, like I said, I had the opportunity to work in Arizona, the, the wheat, you know, wheat um, program, carnal bun, uh, citrus with uh, sun kiss, calava with avocados. And coming in as a regulator, you know, we, we come in here as regulators, we don't know the systems. We don't know their barcoding, you know. I mean, th they have the ability, if you find something in, in Japan or anywhere else, you can, you can look at that box, they have a barcoding, they have a trip ticket. So there's all documentation that you can actually track back to what grower it came and when it was harvested and, and what packing house it came from. So we do not you know, work in that. They also have the ability to track even shipments of wheat and everything else. But with the amount of trade going on and everything else, and it, it'd be, it's critical. I mean, it's impossible if we don't expand those partnerships. And um, that's something actually we do here in Hawaii with, through compliance agreements. Um, you know, we have over 300 compliance agreements just for cut flowers where people, we work with the University of Hawaii, the extension agent, so they look at best practices, they train um, the growers, we work with them, uh, we, we renew the agreements, we have the ability to track things back, but I think, you know, and when we meet with the industry, I mean, we let them know this is your industry. If you're gonna jeopardize it, I mean, you know, this is for everyone, so we all have to be on the table on it, and I think that's something that we need to really look at expanding on, on how we can make those partnerships. I mean, even here, you know, we were talking about like, say, if you, if you need to control something here, but you don't have a, you don't have a quarantine. So you don't have, we don't have the regulatory bite. But then I think that's where we partner with the congressional staff. If, if a distributor or somebody who's dealing with that, and you can find those choke points that everybody have to, has to go to. If the county makes it part of the, or, or the area makes it part of their, you know, requirement, when you get your permit, that everybody who deals with you has to go under this training or under a compliance agreement, then you can control it that way. When we would go into quarantines, for example, 
you know, you can't go for every grower, you can, but you can look at, well, how is it distributed? You have the packing houses and you have the wholesale distributor. So you put them under a compliance agreement, let them know that. You need to let everyone know that as, on this date, no one can move things or you cannot accept things without people going through the training and, and the requirements, but that will take congressional, I mean, congressional support, that will take industry and all of us working together. So I think that's something that we need to expand. We have about 10 minutes left and we're gonna do it with your questions. Who would have a question for the panel? Here, right here. Uh, a microphone's coming right to you, right behind you. May Nakahata, I guess I'm one of the few private industry people in the room. But anyway, my question is on phytosanitary certificates. So I had to import trees from Florida and the first shipment was a small one, just 20 trees, and a frog came along with it. So I reported it to Department of Agriculture. So when the sh second shipment, which is a very big shipment, came in, DOA put people to inspect every tree. So thank you very much. And they found frogs again. And they both came with phytosanitary certificates. So when I asked, um, I was told that, oh, the frogs weren't on the um, no transport or whatever, some kind of a list. But I was very sensitive because, you know, we got the rat lung worm over here in, in the islands and we know that the frogs are a carrier. And so, you know, I'm curious when you have these um, phytosanitary certificates, what does it ca cover really? And when you look at pests, does it also look at, you know, like the frog by itself may not be a pest but it could be a carrier to a human risk pathogen, you know, in this case, the rat lung worm. So will it be considered differently as these new um, risks are identified? Okay, uh, that, okay. There, there, there's the, there is a lot of things to this question. Okay, um, so with regard to the shipments, okay, with regard specific to the phytosanitary certificates, um, do you know what kind of tree it was? Pongam was the Pongamia. Okay, um, so plants are, um, the, so the requirement for a phytosanitary certificate is very specific to the commodity. So with regards to Pongamia, there is no requirement for phyto. So um, I, I, without having seen the phyto, I'm not sure what they were certifying it for. Um, I'm trying to guess what they could certify it for. It's apparently free of Plant, pa plant pests or something like that. Sorry? Well, no, well, uh, 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 unless there's a global point to be made here, when I recess, why don't you two do a sidebar to make sure you go back and forth and understand it? Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, other questions? Yes, there's one right back here, middle. Uh, Matt Bauer, Western IPM Center. Recently, was it announced that the quarantine that was covering um, a, um, not Asian longhorn beetle, um, emerald ash borer in Colorado was going to be dropped because I believe it was USDA has said that the quarantine was not cost effective. Um, I'm kind of curious how this panel feels about um, the idea that quarantines could be dropped because, in fact, they're not effective. Can I go first? I'll give I'll give Vernon some time to think. Go, 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 go. <laughs> so um, you, you just actually might set him up even more. So, uh, <laughs> but you <laughs> no, go I first and that. take a whack at it. Yeah, um, yeah. There was an interesting one. I was in Montana when that was occurring, and so I was, um, you know, it was really interesting to hear the talk about that. And from what I'm understanding is that sometimes things can be dere deregulated because there's no effective control. And my challenge to, um, to regulatory agencies is, have you evaluated that regulation itself might be an effective control? Um, you know, one reason why you make a law that you can't talk on the phone isn't because you're gonna have a policeman at every single place where you might be talking on your phone while driving, but because that regulation prevents people from killing other people or themselves. And so I would challenge um, the idea that if you, if you want to regulate or deregulate something, that you include the value of federal regulation itself or state regulation as an, a control. 
Um, and perhaps there's a middle ground because I know that it gets really expensive and, and tough for federal agencies to manage these giant multi-state things. But maybe again, that's where state partners can come in. And maybe if we were able to continue to regulate at the federal level to have that appearance of regulation, I hate to say it, for the public, um, and then figure out how to backfill with state agencies um, instead of cutting it off one or the other, um, maybe that's the space we can operate in. And I, and Vernon can correct me if that's not possible. Sounds good to me. Well, well you know, <laughs> Vernon, um, you, you might have a comment okay. you're about to make anyway. But let me ask uh, a question which is, th that comes from that to add to it, which is that, y you know, any enforcement, as was said, like law enforcement, um, you hope not to use the enforcement. You hope that people are educated about it so they take the action. How do you educate people so that they know what they're supposed to do and what the consequences are rather than just enforcing on them? Well, you know, on that, I guess, you know, we, it, depending on the program, um, like if we're, if we're gonna deal with nursery stock or whatever, whatever else it is, then we bring all the, all the you know, parties involved and just let them know what, what it is, the consequences, the impact of trade, um, you know, what we're trying to do control. And bring in the university, the experts, um, you know, and, and our science here, but that's kind of what, um, you know, I mean, that's what we try and do. I mean, I guess one example, a fast example that I can utilize was, was California. California, we're setting up fruit fly, you know, fruit fly programs, and in Ventura County, which was Sunkiss, the first time a major production at Rio, where everyone under quarantine. But prior to that going on the, on the quarantine, um, Sunkiss and some of the different groups there came to me and they said, look, we want to be prepared if there's, a, if there's a threat, if there's fruit flies, if there's some kind of pest. So can you come up there with your staff and let's have a meeting. So basically what we discussed is, well, if a pest comes in, then what's going to be affected? Trade, how are we going to treat it? You know, who would be involved? then who would, who would be the first contacts that we would make? So they'd made a, a phone tree of the congressional people, worked with the um, county commissioner, worked with industry and everyone else. So we actually set up, did mock exercises before it ever hit. And when it, actually, when it did hit, we are actually able, because of that communication, we are able to go into, um, into Ventura County, set up a quarantine for the first time that we, you know, it was hundreds of millions of dollars in, in trade because of citrus. But in nine days, we were able to set up a quarantine with 300 growers under a compliance agreement and present our tracking system and open up trade to Japan. You know, and that was because of that pre-work and that, that education. That was something that uh, happened in, in California, so. And, and I guess, on, a, I guess on, the, on the thing, I wasn't involved, I wasn't involved, because like I said, I'm in Hawaii now, but I, ha I wasn't involved in the Emerald Ash Borer, but I know, you know, they look at the, the distribution, you know, of it, the extent of it, and then if there is any kind of um, tools or anything else, but if we don't have the tools or, or they deregulate it, then I know that there's, you know, through Farm Bill or whatever else, we try and continue to put research into, you know, improving those tools or what can be done. And as far as with our agency overall, you know, we, when, we had, when we were part of CBP, we had about almost 3,000, 4,000 employees. You know, now we have about 2,000, and we have, you know, all this program and trade so one of the areas that we look at too, I mean, as far as on a national level is risk-based, you know, partnerships, compliance agreement, but risk-based activities. So we need to look at all of our different activities, what we can be effective, you know, with, with everything coming and pick those higher risk, you know, higher risk areas, unfortunately, I mean, but that's it's similar to, you know, mo most of the different regulatory programs, but that's, you know, what we're dealing with, unfortunately, at the time. Well, we've run out of time, so please join me in thanking this panel for a great discussion. <laughs>